Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accelerating Vehicle Development with Manufacturing Cost Simulation. My name is Steve Peck, and I am the VP of Applications Engineering and Solutions at Apriori. I'm joined by Craig McLeod, the Senior Sales Director at Apriori, responsible for automotive. Let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to, in this session, start by taking a look at what's going on in the automotive industry today and how the landscape is changing. We're then going to focus in on some key areas, including electrification, as well as light weighting, and how the digital uh, product development process can evolve to address some of those challenges. So let's first start by looking at some of the changes in the automotive landscape. And for this, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Craig to um, discuss what's going on in the automotive space today. All right, great. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate that. So yeah, my name is Craig McLeod and I'm a senior sales director responsible for automotive business. And just wanna share uh, what we see, maybe a few key changes that are happening in the automotive landscape. Okay, so uh, one of the things you'll see uh, in both uh, the EMEA region, uh, the Asia Pacific region and the uh, North American region is major push for zero emissions. Um, just recently, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom made an announcement that uh, he's intending that California be zero emissions by 2035. Uh, we've also seen recent announcements from Uber going completely electric by 2030. And in fact, just even today, uh, we saw an announcement from General Motors increasing their uh, investment in their EV strategies and EV vehicles. This is just a quick uh, kind of a synopsis here of the future growth of electric vehicles. You can see that all versions, whether they're you know, plug-in hybrids or fully electrics, uh, are all gonna be growing up in this case to the 2030 timeframe. Note that it is 51%. So we're still going to have, you know, ICEs, internal combustion engines, but it's a much greater uh, portion of the market and something that we're going to continue to see grow even beyond 2030. Here's just a quick snapshot of some of the competitors. And honestly, it's, it's, it's a crazy market right now. These are growing every day. Um, some of them you've maybe heard of, some of them you may not have heard of, but like Candy, Byton is a, is a growing one that's uh, got a large facility here on the West Coast. Some of the ones you have heard of, probably Tesla, and then uh, Rivian is a new one that's uh, really been an up and comer, but there's a, a, a really quickly emerging landscape of new players that's coming into this market every day. And uh, again, these, these emissions regulations and the market are really driving it. Not only has it been in the you know, sedan or coupe uh, market, but also in pickup trucks. Uh, you've probably seen uh, the Cybertruck from Tesla quite a bit, but there's also players, this, this whole truck market is dividing into different segments. Some of them are going specifically after the commercial market. Some of them are going after you know, the, the personnel market. So really all different versions, but all around this truck space, it's really another growing area where there's a lot of practical application. And then some are what they would consider like a super truck where they're going for the really high end part of the market. This is a, a pretty cool example, one that I thought I'd share with you. Um, this is actually a 67 Mustang. And um, Arrival, which is one of our customers, has a division of their uh, corporation that they call Charge Cars. And this is a really cool application where they've actually taken, um, you know, a traditional look vehicle, if you will, and, com and completely converted it over to an EV so that um, it gets all the performance of an electric vehicle 
and and the look of a classic car. One of the other things that's pretty cool is what Arrival has done is made a very flexible, what they call skateboard. This is kind of the common term in the electric vehicle market, but their skateboard not only would uh, be used, let's say, on a UPS truck, but also in this case, a charge car, uh, you know, really cool a rendition of a 67 Mustang. So with that, we've got a little bit of a video here we'll share with you. So my name's Mark Roberts. I'm Chief Creative Officer at Charge Cars. I would say we are redefining iconic classic cars powered by Arrivals technology. All of the hardware you see in front of me here. Using the power inverters, the electric motors, the reduction gearbox and so on. And to complement that, we're using Arrival to make the fenders, doors, the trunk and the hood of the car out of super lightweight composite panels, which is saving us several hundred kilos, massively adding to the performance of the car. The two words I would use to describe what we do at Charge is craftsmanship and technology. So through Arrival, our technology partner, we're taking such an iconic car, a 1967 Mustang, but we're building it as a new vehicle, a whole new heart and soul using cutting edge technology. All right, and I know, don't know that you maybe caught that, but that's also a completely composite vehicle, uh, which we also have cost models for. So it's a pretty cool combination of really high tech electronics and high tech composite. Let's talk a little bit about the historical product life cycle. You know, for years, uh, the automotive industry was in a life cycle that was somewhere around 48 months. Now that is continually uh, decreasing, if you will, as, as the market evolves. There was a time where you would have, you know, an investment up front, obviously, then the vehicle would go into production and you would have to quickly, you know, get that uh, margin back or that profit back, if you will. Now, this is becoming even a more challenging environment. It's typically a 30 to 50 percent shorter in this new product concept and design phase. And the vehicle life is has a shorter tail on it as well. So you've now got 24 months and sometimes less to uh, turn that vehicle around, get it out to the market, get the profit that you need, and then move on to the next phase of, of that vehicle. So it's shorter in the market and uh, really have to be on, on cost and on target in terms of your timing and profit in a very accurate, very short window of uh, opportunity. So this whole idea of reducing the amount of time where you can get your margin is, is really what that's all about. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Steve, and he'll talk about some of the specific capabilities that we have to overcome these challenges. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Craig. Um, so one of the keys, as we saw with that um, example of the electric vehicles, your cars, your trucks, even your classics being electrified, it's really driving a big change. And it's one area that we um, feel is very important to focus on in, in terms of the electrification. What we're actually seeing um, is that the value in the vehicle will be shifting from the chassis and drive, drivetrain to the electronics and sensors to the point where uh, estimates have it at 50% of the value um, of the vehicle being in electronics um, as we move in towards over the next decade here. So. What are some of the, the challenges that this, this will bring? Um, so in terms of the electrical content, we're really focusing on your printed circuit board assemblies and your wire harnesses that are connecting the vehicle. And it's often seen as a black box, um, limited visibility into the costs associated with those and the processes in terms of working with suppliers um, are by no means optimized. The components themselves are a significant cost contributor. Uh, they're constantly changing. You have issues with life cycles. You have variability in terms of cost based on demand. Um, and information 
that's typically stored in a variety of places if managed at all. Um, and when we look at costs, there's um, a, an issue in terms of understanding the entire vehicle and the electrical mechanical um, aspects of that. So being able to understand the costs of, you know, we've been talking over the past two days here with, um, you know, all the capabilities to simulate your mechanical processes. Well, if for completeness, you really need to be able to consider the electrical components as well um, and take that into consideration to really have a full roll up. So with a priori, in terms of electronics cost management, we have a very robust uh, solution for costing PCBAs and wire harnesses that allow for very quick analysis, consistency across the different uh, teams or users that'll be analyzing them and providing the details in terms of the components themselves as well as the transformation costs in the build process. Um, and really, this is by digitizing the process, it's helping to enable engineering to make early decisions prior to going out and quoting and having insight um, to be able to respond quicker to their customers. The contract manufacturers to be able to respond very quickly and consistently to uh, quotes and ensure that they're hitting their, their target margins. And for the OEs to really form more strategic uh, relationships with suppliers, uh, that transparency that Daniel uh, just spoke about in terms of the Harman uh, presentation, where it's critical that, that you're able to work closely with your suppliers, but also ensure that it's, it's a win-win on both sides and that you're able to negotiate and make sure everybody is, um, is aligned. Um, with this solution, uh, we saw in a session earlier today where Stephanie Mills covered our solution in depth and covered uh, demonstrations, we're powered and, and partnered with uh, Silicon Expert, which allows us to consolidate and get accurate real-time cost information and, and uh, physical property information on the components that ultimately drive and help that, that roll-up of the cost be, um, be pulled together and consistent across all users. And that gets coupled with comprehensive manufacturing process coverage from initial prep processes all the way through testing and in integration of your, your uh, printed circuit board assemblies and your wire harnesses. So just to, to touch upon uh, electrification in some of the key aspects of the solution, um, if you wanted to, to go back and look at the recording, um, that would be very helpful for you. So let's talk a little bit about light weighting. So it was interesting in the video we saw with the 67 um, fastback from Charge Cars, you know, it was, there was a mention of pulling several hundred kilos out of the, out of the car by using carbon fiber panels for the deck lid, the uh, hood, and the uh, fenders on that vehicle to do a couple of things, enhance performance, potentially extend range with electric vehicles. Pulling, uh, pulling weight out of it is a way to, to get Addition, additional miles or kilometers out of the vehicle. And it applies as well to your internal combustion engines where you get uh, increased fuel economy. And of course, the performance benefits in terms of acceleration with uh, internal combustion engines, you can only get so much out of horsepower and you get a better payback uh, potentially by pulling weight out of the vehicle and the, um, the performance characteristics and handling can all be enhanced. So certainly some benefits there. So how, what are some of the approaches to light weighting? So a few key things to do is uh, potentially look at alternate materials or alternate processes. So um, as we saw with, with charge there, the use of composites um, is, you know, vehicles are, are containing various levels, but it's in conjunction with other materials. So aluminums, high strength steels, titaniums, magnesiums. It's actually changing a lot about the vehicle, not the individual, not only the individual parts themselves, but the way they're joined in the manufacturing processes. There's adhesives being used. There's self-piercing rivets. We look at a vehicle like the uh, Ford F-150 when that went all aluminum, it, it really drove a lot of changes and some uncertainty about those, uh, those changes in materials. An alternate way is to look at the process. So we see more and more activity in the area of additive. Um, we have you know, processes around composites, looking at 
um, you know, multi-component sheet metal assemblies and potentially that could be a casting, for example. Um, so various ways of looking at different processes to, you know, help with overall part quality, pulling weight out of the part, and also potentially driving some cost out of, um, out of the vehicle. The question is, how do you evaluate the costs of all these alternatives? So let's take a look at an example here of a, uh, a lift gate assembly. This is uh, an assembly that you know early design uh, has been completed on, and there was a, a request that came through from the dynamics group looking to pull three kilograms out of the um, out of this assembly. Well. One way to, to start to think about this is possibly changing the material instead of a, a steel lift gate, potentially um, it could be, it could be uh, changed to aluminum. Well, how long would that take cost engineering group to go through that analysis and return the updated cost? And what if there was a supplier involved and you had to go through the RFQ process to really understand how much it's going to cost you potentially to drive those uh, three kilograms out of the design? Well, with a priori, we went through the analysis. Of course, the, the CAD work has to be done. The gauge of the aluminum was, uh, was thickened up. There was uh, assembly process changes to, to move away from a, a, um, a spot welding process to uh, some adhesives. And this was analyzed. And we can quickly see that we've gone from 12.29 kilograms down to 9.07. So we actually hit the mass target and we can see what that's going to cost us. And actually there was a cost associated with that, but we were able to go through that analysis in a matter of minutes or hours versus days and weeks. So to be able to help provide informed decisions, um, you, you can leverage the capabilities here for doing that. Another way, let's look at an example here of an individual component that is ready to be, um, released, goes through stress analysis with, um, with successful results coming back through, and then it goes out for RFQ. And there's this time spent waiting, only to find out that it's come back and, it, and the price is just unacceptable. It's way too expensive. So redesign activities uh, occur. So geometry is modified, um, removed some material, reanalyzed uh, in CAE to make sure that it structurally is still sound, and then back through the RFQ process and waiting again. So all that time waiting is really is, is not helping in terms of getting to an optimized design. So what if you could use that time to get through another iteration? The problem is that with the compressed time to market and the chart that uh, Craig showed earlier on where your development cycles have compressed, time is really of the essence and um, you need to be able to, to work under those pressures. Um, waiting on supplier feedback and RFQs, that's just another bottleneck in the process. So with a priori, we can quickly go through those, uh, that analysis. Designers can, can use that extra time in terms of um, you know, waiting on, on RFQ responses only to find out that it's too, too expensive. You know, several weeks can be, can be wasted where that time could have been spent further optimizing the design, driving out weight and cost from the design. So in this case here, there was an additional um, uh, weight reduction as well as a cost reduction by getting that extra cycle in. So continuing on that theme of compressed schedules and really how processes can, um, can potentially evolve to take advantage of, of digital threads and, um, and the capabilities that a, a uh, digital solution can provide. There's opportunities for sure in terms of market share. We see, you know, as, as Craig put up with all of the new vehicle entrants coming in, getting to market first gives you a big competitive advantage. However, um, you still need to be able to make sure that you're hitting profitability targets. 
looking at the new technologies and exploiting them. We looked at materials and processes. There's uncertainty and risk associated with them. So how do you provide the insights to really understand that manufacturing process and the costs associated with it so that you can get the most out of those new technologies that you're adopting? And going back again to working with the supply chain, you know, looking at you know, is, it, is this going to be made internally or is it going to be uh, outsourced? And establishing those partnerships with transparency with your suppliers, um, just exactly what, uh, what Daniel was talking about with the, um, with the Harmon use case and how um, you can have transparency to make it a win-win on both sides. So what are the barriers to optimizing this development process from the earliest stages of concept design to getting the vehicle out and delivered to the end, end user. Well, one bottleneck that we see is inefficient design collaboration. There's a lot of people and a lot of um, groups within the organization involved and even extending out to the suppliers, lots of iteration and back and forth that there's, there's opportunity to improve. Manufacturing issues, you know, having those come up after the fact and trying to, um, you know, scramble to um, not only, you know, um, process very costly ECOs that in some cases, you know, $5,000 for an ECO is not un unheard of by any means, but in such a compressed time frame, you don't have, you're not at liberty to, to you know, deal with issues that, that come up and just extend the process. So um, being able to address ECOs early on and make sure that you're hitting cost targets. The time to go back and perform VAVE activities is limited um, in order to, to maximize productivity in such a compressed schedule. And make sure that those supplier um, relationships the, the struggles that are there in terms of the lack of transparency. And in many cases, we see that a quote packages go out to suppliers that, you know, are not well suited for them, are not necessarily, um, you know, going to even potentially be bid on or bid completely on. And it puts undue stress on the suppliers having to respond to those. Um, so if we look at what we can do about this whole thing and really transform the process, it's um, looking at the digital twin and what could you do if you could lever leverage the digital twin to analyze parts for cost and manufacturability very early on um, upon design and check into your PLM system. Look at the parts and identify the issues on those parts from a design to cost and a design for manufacturability standpoint so that you have insight into where you stand from a target cost and that um, those manufacturability issues that are driving cost or are going to result in an ECO can be identified early on. Being able to highlight those features in the cost drivers and provide some guidance for how to fix them so that the designer can go in work on just the parts that need uh, to be addressed and, and make those changes in CAD and make the updates and then get the right information to the right people at the right time. So consumers in manufacturing, in sourcing, cost engineering, and even the supply base, having the right information to really help accelerate the process, eliminate the bottlenecks related to communication and provide the right information um, to, to take the right decisions to optimize the vehicle. So our solution, we've seen this uh, different presentations throughout the course of the, the couple of days and really lots of traction and really being able to, to um, drive adoption in engineering to provide that cost and visibility is, is really enabled by our Cost Insight Generate solution that allows the design engineer to check the models into PLM, have the cost and manufacturability analysis happen in the background, information passed back to the main repository in PLM. So your cost information, manufacturing, um, manufacturability scores, and then get that information to the design engineer so that they can go address the parts in question, work interactively with the CAD system and focus on what's important. Um, and 
With all of that said, with the challenges of electrification, light weighting, the need to address the uh, compressing schedule, it's really all about embracing the digital uh, digital thread and digital manufacturing to adapt to these changes. So making sure that you can meet those aggressive schedules with a digitally transformed development process, achieving target costs, avoiding manufacturability issues early, minimizing the risks associated with those unknowns, and finally, you know, enabling the collaboration across the enter enterprise, leveraging the um, digital twin. So that's what we see as the, um, the ultimate way to really change the way that vehicles are developed today, to really take advantage of the digitization, to bring more insight early on in the process. So with that said, we wanna open it up. We have a couple minutes left for any questions. All right, we had a couple of questions uh, during your session there that I was able to uh, stay on top of. Um, one of the ones that was coming in this other panel here um, is really around the automated workflows with PLM. And the question is really, how do you develop a full cost, uh, taking tolerances and secondary processes into consideration when you're automating all that? Sure, I think there's a couple of different um, answers to that or, or approaches to that. One is more of a collaboration approach, right? Where we showed that slide there when, it, when the feedback went directly to design engineering. You could envision cases and we have some uh, of our customers that actually have cost engineers that receive the initial feedback. They'll refine results um, add in secondary processes, make sure tolerances are, um, are captured and everything is accounted for, and then uh, act as a gate, if you will, and then pass on recommendations for changes to designers and act as basically a, a gate in the process where they can add their insights as part of the overall collaborative solution. The other aspect from a technical standpoint is that there's things that can be done. So we support model-based definition and the import of PMI if tolerances have been added and things like secondary processes, anodizing, painting, inspection, if you will. Attributes could be captured on the CAD model itself that automate the addition of those in the costing process with a priori. So a couple of different approaches, one a technical approach, the other more of a organizational uh, type approach to have different people in the mix. All right, excellent. And then um, you talked a lot about uh, being able to roll up like the complete vehicle cost of the electronics and the mechanical side of the equation. What about the uh, capital or tooling side of the, of the process, Steve? Yes, absolutely. So a priori for, plastic molding, stamping, casting, composites, sheet metal forming. We provide a tooling cost directly from the part design where you have insight as to what that tool will cost. And it can either be um, taken as just a number up front um, or it can be amortized into the piece part cost of all of the, uh, all of the components across the total volume. All right, excellent, very good. I think we're uh, approaching the end of our session here. Just want to say thank you very much to all the folks that uh, brought in questions and had some dialogue with, and for all the folks that attended. Um, again, uh, we've got our contact information there for both Steve and myself. Uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, I've been here about five years. I know Steve's been here a long time, so we, uh, we know most of you, but uh, look forward to any other additional questions and uh, dialogue that you might have. And uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank All right, you. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon.